History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 27, Will and Reason, February 23rd, 1965. Ladies and gentlemen, since I face a hopeless task in dealing with all the material I had intended to present to you, I believe that my best course will be simply to proceed as if nothing very amiss and to break off next Thursday at the point I happen as if nothing were amiss and to break off next Thursday at the point I happen to have reached. Any other solution, any attempt to round off these lectures would be artificial and of no benefit to you. I hope, therefore, that their fragmentary nature, something that seems almost inherent in their form, will not come as too much of a disappointment to you. I shall perhaps repeat what I brought to your attention last time. This was that, despite the opposition between theoretical and practical reason of which Kant makes so much, reason qua reason remains the same, separate from objectivity of every kind. That is to say, this Kantian concept of reason remains purely instrumental, and even the concept of practical reason lacks all trace of what I have called the additional factor. If we think of the will as a unity in tension between reason and this other factor, then we might speak of it as the voluntaristic element in a narrower sense. <clears throat> now in Kant, and I believe this will give you an idea why reason has the same meaning in both theory and practice in Kant, and why the concept of reason should play this peculiar, even ambivalent role in his thought. In Kant, reason is the refuge of ontology. By this I mean the following. Formerly, an order was supposed to exist in being itself, and was looked for there. This was an objective order, however you might wish to interpret the word objective. This objective order was then dissolved by nominalism, but elements of it were transposed into the very organ which nominalism has used to effect that dissolution, namely reason itself, which nominalism came to regard as being in itself. On the other hand, however, in its Kantian formulation, reason is nothing but the quintessence of the subjective capacity for thought, or subjective thought as such. This is the source of the curious ambivalence in the concept of reason as it is employed by Kant. On the one hand, reason is pure subjectivity, that is to say, it is purified of everything non-mental, everything that is not itself subjective. On the one hand, reason is pure subjectivity. That is to say, it is purified of everything non-mental, everything that is not itself subjective. I already read that part. On the other hand, it is the prototype of every conceivable objectivity. That is, it is being in itself, the thing in which the possibility of an order of contingent being is concentrated. This is summed up in Kant's famous definition. Objectivity is simply what can be known according to the rules of reason. Thus, thus, the entire Kantian project of salvaging the idea of objective truth that had been undermined by nominalism was founded on this ambiguity. Note that this project was based not on a leap outside subjectivity, but was enacted in subjectivity, or at least passed through it. The ambiguity in Kant's concept of reason, which I have touched on without being able to explain its implications fully, is extended to his concept of the will. This will come as no surprise to you, now that I have made it clear that, that his notion of will is basically nothing but reason in the sense that reason is supposed to be capable of creating its own objects, namely actions. As spontaneity, the will is supposed to be the innermost principle of subjectivity, the thing that cannot be objectified, as we see in his conception of theoretical reason, whose central idea is the idea of spontaneity, or, as he calls it, the original apperception. However, since it is both stable and identical with itself, it becomes objectified and is converted into what goes by the name of character and the developed form of Kant's moral philosophy, where it plays a crucial role, or where it plays a crucial role. In other words, it becomes a hypothetical being within the empirical world, or, at any rate, a being that is credited with the possibility of impinging on the empirical, something that would be inconceivable in the absence of an affinity to that world, and this makes it commensurable with the empirical world. <clears throat>
Because the will gives itself a shape in existence, this ontological objectivity we find in Kant, an objectivity of pure efficacy, itself achieves a sort of existence, if you like a second-degree existence, a derivative existence. This purely ontological aspect of the will, of the will as something that exists in itself, independently of all conditions, then reverts in Kant without his drawing attention to it explicitly into something ontic, a piece of existence in itself, something that is expressed in his use of the term character. It is only because of this ontic dimension that we can say that the will creates its own objects and the object world, namely actions. Were this not the case, were the will really nothing more than pure possibility and not also something existing in the world, this would imply the existence of such a platonic abyss between the will as an idea and the world to which it stands posed, that we would be unable to conceive of real actions proceeding from the will into the world. Such an idea would be exposed to the same criticism as Aristotle's criticism of Plato's doctrine of ideas, and it is worth noting that this aspect of Kant's philosophy is in fact very close to Plato. We may perhaps, we may perhaps home, home in, hone in on this criticism of Kant's doctrine of the unity of reason by saying that it presupposes the abstract separation of reason from its referent, from what it relates to and what it continues to be determined by. In the same way, every synthesis and reason is, after all, the capacity for synthesis, does more than create order and structure and things that are external to it and contingent. It becomes truth only by expressing as a synthesis the substantial content of the underlying objects. This is one of the hardest things to grasp about philosophical or speculative logic, because the fact is that these two elements cannot be separated. There can be no synthesis, no judgment, unless what is being joined together in fact belongs together. In other words, it does not belong together simply because it is joined together, if I may put it in this way. The difficulty is the curious one that every attempt to resolve it in, in one direction or the other, without including its opposite, is necessarily doomed. Incidentally, this contradiction at the heart of synthesis seems to me to contain the innermost philosophical justification of what we understand by dialectics. Kant does not proceed in the spirit of this duality, this insistence that there can be no synthesis in the absence of things synthesized, but instead he splits the form of knowledge from its content. This was the objection that Hegel forcefully advanced by way of criticism. He was the first to do so, although in the same objections had been implicit in Maimon and Fichte. Maimon, Maimon and Fichte. <laughs> However, this criticism applies also to Kant's doctrine of the will, because his theory of the will and hence of freedom is structured in the same way as his doctrine of reason. This definition of the will, this doctrine of the will, is falsified by the absolute separation of the will from its material, in other words, of the will from what it is supposed to set in motion. Instead of giving you a long-winded explanation of this, I would prefer to show you what is meant with a very simple and, as I believe, very persuasive illustration. It is well known that in one of its versions, the categorical imperative states that we should never treat human beings merely as means, but always as ends, whatever we are to understand here by treat. If other human beings were simply material, with which to ignite the pure action of the will, to use Fick's way of speaking. If, then, the will were not also determined by the objects of its action, namely by other human beings, to whom Kant makes explicit reference, then action strictly in accordance with the categorical imperative would at the same time violate this, that same imperative. That is to say, it would bring about the very thing that the categorical imperative wishes to prevent. Human beings would in fact be no more than a means. They would be a means whereby the categorical imperative is to be fulfilled, instead of being included within the scope of the categorical imperative as ends in themselves. In consequence, the very mode of behavior that Kant recommends as the supreme expression of the principle of morality turns into immorality, pure and simple. For, in that case, human beings would in fact become mere means for a second time,
not indeed the means to any inferior or secondary ends, but the means by which the moral law could be fulfilled. This is a conclusion which, monstrous though it may appear to you, was one actually drawn by Fichte in his moral philosophy. We can put it another way. We can say that in Kant's philosophy, moral behavior is supposed to be more concrete than mere theoretical behavior. This is because it is enacted and takes shape in reality. In the event, it turns out to be even more formal than theoretical action because in his philosophy, theoretical action is at least attached to some sort of material. This material may be thought of as free of all qualities, as chaotic or amorphous, but it still makes its presence felt in every possible way in the formulations of theoretical reason, even if only as a marginal concept. Here we have reached the point where modern critics, Schiller above all, have raised objections to Kant's moral philosophy. What they disliked was its formalism. Before saying something briefly about that formalism, I should like to make you aware that, in contrast to Schiller's position, Schiller, incidentally, was my predecessor in this post many years ago, things have changed in important and even crucial respects. Kant is always castigated for his formalism, by which is meant that substantive and concrete elements of the good or of good actions are not only absent, but are in fact tab taboo. However, the point is that this fact in itself contains an element of content or substance. Um, this formulation contains the entire history of rationalization of Western philosophy and Western society, including its progressive aspects. It is my belief that when people talk about the problem of so-called formalism and ethics, they are all too easily tempted to ignore this element. If I may formulate this more concretely, I would say that so-called Kantian formalism incorporates the recognition of the bourgeois equality of all subjects, not just before the law, the legal system, but also before the moral law. Anyone who, like me, has had experience of what the world looks like when this element of formal equality is removed from the legal system, let us say, in favor of specific substantive values that are asserted in a priori fashion, he will know from his own experience, or at the very least from his own fear, just how much of humane value resides in this concept of the formal. When distinctions all vanish in their object, that is to say, when all human beings are reduced to the abstract definition of human being, to the exclusion of their specific characteristics, this provides people with a measure of protection and justice. If I call this principle the bourgeois principle or a progressive bourgeois principle, what I mean to say is simply that it spells the abolition of feudal privileges at the hands of bourgeois society, privileges that extended even into logic, or at least into the logical foundations of moral philosophy. Thus, the idea of equality before the law on the one side and on the other the fascist distinction according to specific allegedly a priori differences that are supposed to exist between people once and for all. This distinction is truly crucial. Let me sum up the position more generally, more fundamentally in a thesis, or what would formerly have been called a theorem. Our world, as you know, is organized according to the principle of exchange, the principle of equality. It is a world governed by abstract rules. In an unchanging abstract system, every appeal to concrete distinctions always necessarily becomes an injustice to concrete human beings. It could be shown that Scheller's material value ethics already signals the return of ideas based on privilege. And even though it would be wrong to accuse Scheller of fascist leanings, Ernst Tscholz was not far off the mark in his book on historicism, when he claimed that the turn to the concrete and material in Scheller was a kind of prelude to a general political reaction. If you think that the concept of the concrete has to bear the kind of metaphysical weight I assume it does, if you believe that utopia has what I would call the color of the concrete, it becomes all the more important to oppose the terrible, catastrophic misuse of the term and to prevent it from being hypostasized and from being used as a weapon with which to sabotage reason. On the other hand, however, and this has to be said if we wish to, to be even-handed,
the abstract nature of legal and moral systems is no less unjust. They cut away everything specific to living human beings and treat them as if they were merely impersonal parties to contracts. For in our world, every category conceived in isolation inevitably leads to violence and injustice. Aristotle showed he understood this in the Nicomachean Ethics when he supplemented the concepts of justice and righteousness with that of fairness, equity. And this involved an an admirable attempt to incorporate the incommensurable natural distinctions between beings in the rational order without bursting the bounds of that order. This theory still survives in our ordinary phrase, that's all right and proper. So deeply is this problem engraved in the spirit of the language, but whether this attempt at inclusion is possible or whether a far greater effort and a far more radical solution is called for is something I should like to leave for you to meditate on. At any rate, Kantian ethics owes its semblance of objectivity exclusively to this formalism and hence to its upper subjectivism. By excluding every objective determinant, it becomes in in its own view, according to its own self-understanding, pure being, being in itself. But that in turn condemns it as pure being to the kind of irrationality that proclaims itself in the coercive principle of Kantian ethics, the coercive side of the categorical imperative about which I have talked repeatedly. And if I may try once again to clarify this, I would say that, when you come down to it, to act in accordance with the moral law really always means obey, fit in with the moral law without having complete insight. The attempt to obtain complete insight is associated by Kant himself with doubting its absolute validity and is accordingly defamed by his use of the term pseudo-rationality or sophistry or sophistical skepticism. But by the same token, an element of truth is unmistakable in the objectification of the will of which I have spoken. This consists in in the way in which the self achieves autonomy, in which the various stirrings, the divergent and frequently diffuse stirrings of the self, nevertheless retain a certain identity and come to form what the language of our experience is accustomed to call our character. Character is an intermediate term between nature because it has its place in the constituted world as a synthesis of manifestations and the mundus intelligibilis because by virtue of that unity, it can oppose the natural impulses of the isolated individual or at any rate, keep them under control. Since Kant's philosophy is constructed on the principle of non-contradiction, this gives rise to the difficulty that its concepts become apparatical That is to say, they must give rise to assertions that are mutually contradictory. Since these difficulties arise from the criteria of non-contradiction that Kant has made his own, he must bear the blame for them. However, they disappear as soon as we free ourselves from the idea that any concept of this sort, in this case the concept of character, must be all of a piece and free from contradictions. For in fact, the very essence of such a concept requires it to contain contradiction, to be antithetical or full of tensions. Incidentally, this highly significant intermediate position of character between nature and the intelligible world has been explored in great depth without any of the methods of dialectics and a very important early essay by Walter Benjamin, Fate and Character, which I suggest that you should all read at some point. I believe that it is one of the most important recent contributions to the problem we are discussing here. The will, then, is always a diversion from the immediate goal of the instincts. It is sublimation. If we talk about the will in general terms, if we say, for example, that someone is strong-willed, then we are talking about his character, the harmonious unity of his actions, according to a central principle that, that dominates him. An idea that is, in fact, not too far removed from from Kant's own localized principle. The opposite of the will and the character would then be what has been dissolved, just as, to remind you of something you all know, the subtitle of Mozart's Don Giovanni Giovanni is is Il Dissoluto Punito, that is, the rake punished, in which, in which the word rake translates dissoluto, a dissolute man, 
one who resolves in all directions, who is not subject to a sustained, harmonious, rational principle. This leads us to the heart of the moral taboos on polygamy and li libertinism. The use of infidelity as an example always points to the failure of the unifying dis discipline of the concept of the ego. Those of you who possess a copy of the Dialectic of Enlightenment, I know that it is not easily obtainable. But those of you who have managed to get a hold of one will find some very interesting things in the second excursus. The one dealing with the Marquise de Sade's Juliet about this idea that a strict morality is a way of turning against a diffuse nature. They are very interesting because the wish to glorify the dominant unifying principle over an instinctual and diffuse nature in the bourgeois age brings together thinkers whose ideas are otherwise incompatible. Indeed, on this point, they are so very much in agreement that it would be easy to discover passages from one in the writings of another, even though on other matters, they would be willing to condemn one another to the flames of hell. The progressive element in this Kantian doctrine can be compared to the progressive aspect of Protestantism. There's a decisive break with the medieval, medieval justification by works, and this takes place inwardly in the moral world of the subject and not just in the idea of a justification before God. Human beings are to be judged not by their individual acts, but as the saying goes, by what they are. I may remind you of Schiller's saying, with which you are probably more or less familiar. Common natures pay with what they do, noble ones with what they are. I would note that what is interesting about this quotation, particularly from the point of view of theory, is that Schiller, who was a Kantian, makes use of the concept of nature here, at a point where it is least expected, something that would surely have been anathema to Kant. This will be comprehensible only if you recollect that Schiller was very concerned to bridge the radical gulf, the Kantian charismos, between spirit and nature that Kant had introduced, and in this respect he was very much in agreement with Goethe. Hans von Bullo disciple and friend of Richard Wagner, a man of a caustic turn of mind, joked about this Schillerian sentiment that common natures pay with what they do, while noble ones pay with what they are. He remarked that this must mean that it was the noble natures who avoided paying their debts. This joke points to the central issue, and there is no reason to believe that Bilal was conscious of its far-reaching philosophical implications that the sedimented interiorization that is involved here constitutes an offense against the individual living person. It also has the further consequence that, by establishing a polarity between a person's individual acts and his individual works, on the one hand, and his actual being on the other, this anti-naturalistic moral philosophy goes into reverse and ends up in a kind of doctrine of nature that amounts to the assertion that if a person is noble, that is to say noble by nature, everything is permissible to him, whereas lesser human beings are not similarly entitled. This idea, incidentally, was not completely alien to Goeth. His Faust, after all, asserts that a good man in his dark, bewildered stress well knows the path from which he should not stray. And having said that, he is promptly taken up into heaven despite the fact that he has committed foul murder, as well as other horrific crimes and that in old age he has, tactil he has tacitly co colluded in the violent death of Philemon and Bacchus, an elderly married couple, simply because he cannot bear the fact that their wretched little house blocks the view of his vast estate. I do not know whether Kant scholars have ever taken a closer look at these matters. I should like to return briefly to the relationship between reason and will. From what I have said, you will have understood that I understand this relationship to be one of discontinuity. I have explained this discontinuity from the vantage point of the will, but it might equally well be explained from the point of view of reason. In the shape of objectivity, of so-called logical reason, reason has its origin in the suppression of impulse and of impulses of the will. Reason has become what it is only because it has separated itself from that additional factor, from the element of impulse that is characteristic of the will, and this testifies to the fact of discontinuity. It is like the common figure of speech about wishful thinking, which I have mentioned several times in the course of these lectures, a type of thinking in which the wish and 
is father to the thought. This kind of wishful thinking has parted company with theoretical reason in the narrower sense, with pure thought as such. This voluntaristic element has vanished from logic in the Hegelian sense. What is crucial for logic is to be something in its own right, but this disappearance of origins of the impulse behind thought in logic conceals the fact that it is above all the logical form of organization that serves domination, that logical thought and the discipline that logic requires of human beings is itself dependent, conditioned by the power of the will. <coughs> Reason only becomes available as an instrument for every conceivable desire through its objectification, through its being uncoupled from desire. The eradication of will from thought, from reason in its succinct sense, from theoretical thought, is the price reason must pay for its being, put absolutely at our disposition for every conceivable purpose. In other words, for its being of practical use. The relatedness of logic, in other words, the element of will contained in the fact that logic is always concerned with something not itself, and what it wants, or what something or other wants with it, survives in a highly etiolated state and the fact that logical propositions are all necessarily related to something or other. This compels me to modify and refine a number of theoretical statements that I've made in the past about logical absolutism and, ob and objectification in my against epistemology, but I find that time has run out and this will have to wait for next time.